Now entering Nerdist.com. The Mission Log, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast, episode 4, where no man has gone before. Beaming into your pod stream, it's another episode of Mission Log, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. I'm your co-host, John Champion. And I'm Ken Ray. Each week, our mission is to watch an episode of Star Trek and answer a few questions. What's the message? What's the moral? Does the episode stand the test of time? And what's that on that guy's head? Though this question only works when there's actually something on somebody's head. Usually a guy's head, actually. This week, we're looking at the second pilot for Star Trek, where no man has gone before. Meet the crew of the Enterprise. Again. For the first time. Again. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It is. (laughs) But but, but this is momentous. You know, this is the rare time in TV history that somebody got the news, well, we're not buying your pilot, but go make another one. Yeah, right. And they make no bones. About oh, it. yeah, thank sing, you. Yeah, because guess. there is no bones. There is, <laughs> there is no bones. The bones have not been cast yet. Right. Apparently, there's some other guy. Don't get used to him, but we'll talk about him in a minute, a tiny bit. There are also, right. also a couple of notable, well, I guess it's before they were big. They're notable in retrospect. A couple of notable uh, guest stars mm-hmm. for this Who episode. Who do we have here? Uh, yeah. Well, you got Sally uh, Kellerman as Dr. Elizabeth Daner. And Gary Lockwood as Lieutenant Commander Gary, I'm the God Mitchell. Um, Sally and, Kellerman, of course, would go on to play Margaret Hotlips O'Houlihan in the movie version of MASH, the one by Robert Altman, which is, you know, great. And she was also the sexy older professor in uh, Rodney Dangerfield's Back to School. I loved her in that movie. She was terrific. I, and I'm talking, of course, about Back to School, not MASH. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, she was. Well, I mean, it, well, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah. I will say too much about myself if I say what I thought of her in that movie, so let's just move on. Gary Lockwood. <laughs> he's actually, he's the real, I mean, and it's so weird because his his time in 2001, let me back up. He mm-hmm. gained his real science fiction racing stripes in 2001, A Space Odyssey, playing the all-too-human Dr. Frank Poole. Though you could argue that he's all-too-human in this Star Trek episode as well, but I would imagine we're going to argue about that, or at least, you know, talk about that in just a bit. Um it's weird because there are so few people in 2001 A Space Odyssey Yeah, that if you're in 2001 A Space Odyssey, you're automatically awesome, Yeah, in, in my opinion. Because you got – I know there were the Russians who uh, whose names I can't remember. Uh, and then, of course, there were the monkey people, but you don't really you know, <laughs> right. know the monkey people. There's whoever right. played uh, uh, Dr. Haywood Floyd. And then there are the two astronauts and, and you know, the, the, the voice of Hal. If you're a human in 2001, you pretty much have the job of representing humanity. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and and Dr. Frank Poole, while while sadly not long for, you know, the space between this world and Jupiter or this world and <laughs> yeah, Jupiter. It was Saturn in the book. It was Jupiter in the movie. Right. Um, right. I mean, you know, we see him running around. I think we spend his birthday with him, you know, yeah. good, good times. And so it really is neat. I mean, just I mean, 2001 was such an amazing movie for yeah. so many reasons. And so it, it's neat, even though I know I know. That Gary Lockwood did a lot of other work. Um, it, it's neat to see him in this context and know that you know in just a few years he'll also uh, he'll also be on Discovery to uh, to the gate. <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah. it's, it's just kind of yeah. It, well, it I, I'll say this. It. Yeah, yeah, I'll say this about Gary Lockwood. You know, he's an actor who seems very much at home in uh, outer space. He's totally <laughs> believable in two thousand one. He's totally believable in uh, Star Trek. So uh, <laughs> if we could have only had more of Gary Lockwood in outer space. Yeah. Wouldn't that be camper. Wouldn't yeah. that be neat? Maybe yeah. we, could, we could start a petition or something. Yeah, exactly. Send Gary Lockwood this space. <laughs> We've secretly replaced the normal rules of mortality usually served to Frank Poole and Margaret O'Houlihan with practically unlimited power. Let's see what happens. The Enterprise receives a distress signal. And is there really any better way to begin an episode? This one's interesting because it's from a ship that's been lost and gone for over 200 years, the SS Valiant. Even more amazing, it's from beyond our galaxy, a border we thought no ship had crossed before. 
The Enterprise finds not a ship, but the spaceship equivalent of an airplane's black box. The Enterprise goes to red alert for a reason that I must have missed, and we go to the opening credits. Act 1. On the way to the bridge, we meet Lieutenant Commander Gary Mitchell. Obviously Kirk's friend, he serves under Kirk on the Enterprise. He'll be behind the wheel as the Enterprise leaves the galaxy. On the bridge, we meet the department heads. Sulu, head of astro sciences. Scotty, head of engineering. Dr. Piper, head of life sciences. Don't get used to him. And the recently arrived psychiatrist, Dr. Elizabeth Daner. Don't get used to her either. Spock is working with the flight recorder from the Valiant, trying to piece together how it ended up in pieces. From what he's hearing, the Valiant was thrown from the galaxy, crossed back in, encountered something that killed seven, no wait, six crew members, and sparked a huge interest from the crew of the Valiant in ESP, or extrasensory perception. Dr. Daner says she's tested high in ESP ability, though it's not much, just a heightened sensitivity in her estimation. Spock's investigation also seems to reveal that the captain of the Valiant ended up ordering the ship's destruction, wherefore we know not. This actually spurs Kirk to take the Enterprise out of the galaxy, because we got to know, you know, what might happen so we can warn others. So out they go, and then they hit a thing that may or may not be there. It blows out the controls, damages the ship, and kills 11, no wait, 9 Enterprise crew members. Dr. Daner and Gary Mitchell are uh, simply knocked out for a bit. Daner comes to immediately with no apparent changes, while Mitchell takes a little longer to come to. And when he wakes up, something's up with his eyes. Act 2. The Enterprise limps back across into the galaxy. With the exception of the impulse engines, the Enterprise is dead in the water. No main engines, no warp drive. Kirk decides they have to figure out what happened to the Valiant, since that might help them figure out what happened to them. Spock, in trying to figure out what happened to them, notices that the people who were knocked out or killed during the crossing had high ESP ratings, with Gary and Daner sporting the highest. Gary, meanwhile, is in sickbay, though one can't really say he's recovering since he says he's never felt better. Ever. We learn here about his friendship with Kirk, a little bit more about it, though it seems the friendship is already starting to wear thin for the recently changed Gary, who warns Kirk not once but twice that Kirk had better be good to him. He's reading philosophy, you see, and getting new ideas about the nature of God, and he finds them simplistic. Kirk decides to keep Gary under surveillance in the sick bay, where Gary becomes a reading machine, ridiculously speedy and with perfect recall. Also, he can speed up or slow down his autonomic systems just by thinking about it, Sure to break the ice at parties. Spock <laughs> says the uh, Gary in sickbay is not Gary Mitchell anymore. Gary's pal Lee Kelso stops by to check on Gary. Gary tells Kelso to check a uh, part of the impulse system for damage, a part that Gary can't possibly have seen. But he has seen it. The image is fresh in Kelso's mind, though Kelso hadn't noticed the damage and literally thought nothing of it. Spock says again that Gary is not Gary. He and Scotty think Gary is trying to control the ship or parts of it from sickbay, and he's not doing a bad job. Sensing the fear of the department heads, Dr. Daner argues that what Gary is becoming could be the forerunner of a new and better kind of human being. Spock says Gary will evolve soon to place to a place that everyone will soon be an annoyance to him. He says they should ditch Gary on an uninhabited world, Delta Vega, or they should kill him. Act 3. To Delta Vega we go, where Kirk hopes to repair the Enterprise and maroon his buddy Gary. Gary, meanwhile, is passing the time in sickbay practicing his newfound ability of telekinesis. Sure to break the ice at parties. Acknowledging the situation, Gary says if he were Kirk, he'd do what Spock was thinking and kill Gary while he still could. That time may have passed, however. Kirk and Spock move on Gary, and he repels them with lightning from his hands. Still, they are able to subdue him and get him down to Delta Vega, where they lock him in a force field cell. He again suggests that Kirk kill him, then tries to break through the force field. This makes his eyes go normal, and the real Gary is present for about five seconds. And when he becomes God Gary again, he's stronger. Kirk decides to rig the Delta Vega facility for destruction and ask Kelso to do the honors, should the honors need doing. Act 4. Repairs to the Enterprise done. Only Spock, Kirk, Daner, Gary, and Kelso remain on Delta Vega. Gary, realizing that Kelso could be a liability with his finger on the the blow-up-the-valley button, strangles Kelso via telekinesis, sure to kill the mood at parties. Daner wants to stay on Delta Vega with Gary. Kirk says no, but so what? Gary breaks out of his cell and knocks Kirk and Spock unconscious just as Dr. Daner's god ability is coming online. Dr. Piper finds Kirk and Spock, does not rouse Spock at Kirk's request. Kirk has to old yeller Gary. It's got to put him out of his misery. Or really out of theirs. Gary, meanwhile, is turning the barren Delta Vega into a decent place for a couple of gods. A task ruined by Kirk looking for Gary to kill him. Kirk appeals to Daner's humanity, presumably still there since she is more recently changed. Gary then sets to toying with Kirk, making him pray to Gary before throwing him into a grave and killing him with a rock. A big rock. Daner asks Gary to stop, but he says morals are for men, not gods. 
Dana and Gary fight. She loses, but weakens Gary. Kirk fights Gary, nearly kills him, then does kill him, a chance he almost lost by being taken by Gary's momentary lapse back into humanity. With both Dana and Mitchell dead, Kirk has entered into the official log that they died in the line of duty. The end. Kind of a weird episode. Wow, yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of a weird episode. Realize, go, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, well you, you picked up on uh, Gary Mitchell's uh, party boy past uh, quite a bit <laughs> in your description there. <laughs> sure to break the ice at parties. Actually, it's a Monty Python thing, but you know. Yeah, yes. No, yeah. there is, I mean, there is, a, there is a bit of swagger to, uh, to Gary. Oh, there's that, a lot of swagger to Gary. Yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah I, I think he uh, outswaggered Kirk in this a little bit. You know, the, the last few episodes we've seen, of course, we're, we're watching this in the air date order. So it's a little bit different. Uh, Kirk, of course, would have been just introduced with this episode. Right. But the Kirk that we've seen so far has been pretty, uh, he's been playing, playing it pretty cool. Well, let's go, know? let's go back to, I mean, there's almost, part of me wants to take this episode out of the Star Trek continuum because... It was the second pilot. I mean, there are yeah. neat things that happen in this episode, especially had it been the first episode. For whatever reason, they did not air it as the first episode of, of when the series was going. Right. But there was, I mean, there was a, uh, and, I, and I do this all the time where I liken it to other shows or I liken other things to this or whatever. There was, there was mm-hmm. this thing about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Stick with me. <laughs> okay. There was a thing about Buffy the Vampire Slayer where uh, the rumor that I heard and this is just talk, and it could be urban legend, but I had heard that what Joss Whedon wanted to do originally was uh, put um, Eric Balfour's character, Jesse, in the opening credits of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and have him Mm. be there for the first three or four episodes. And then if you've watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer, he gets killed, I think, in like episode two or episode three. Mm -hmm. And what he wanted to set up, what, what, what uh, what Joss Whedon supposedly wanted to set up with this idea was... This is kind of a real world scenario, even though we're talking about vampires and demons and all that stuff. It's kind of real world. And these characters that you know and these people who are your friends, you could lose them, which is not something that happens very much in episodic television in the States. I think it happens in the UK a lot more, other parts of the world, but not not here in the States. There is sort of that interesting thing, though. I mean, had this been the first episode of Star Trek, there might have been a little bit more – I mean, the first one to air, there might have been a little more – there might have been more of a sense of danger about it, right? Because Gary and Kirk are friends. And we actually yeah, get the yeah. sense that Gary and Kirk are friends. This is not like, right. you know, it's not like the love boat where a star shows up and you're like, okay, well, they'll be gone at the end of the episode. Or, yeah. or Columbo, you know, where, where it turns out William Shatner is the guy who murdered his wife or, or Leonard Nimoy is the guy who murdered his <laughs> wife or his right. boss or, you know, whichever episode of Columbo they were in. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the, they're here. They're part of the crew. They are our friends and uh, things don't go well for them. Right. Well, and that's kind of what I meant by saying that, you know, uh, Gary Mitchell, Gary Lockwood seems very much at ease on the Enterprise. You just immediately yeah. accept him as part of the crew and as Kirk's friend and his introduction just sort of like bursting into the turbo lift when uh, Spock and Kirk are on their way to the bridge seems very natural. And he's part of the crew. Yeah, he actually um, it's weird. He does bring a level of familiarity because, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if William Shatner just wasn't comfortable yet. I mean, because, I mean, if you think about it, if this was the first one that was filmed, this is his first turn as yeah. Kirk. And so just as an actor and as a guy in this, you know, setting, and I know he's got, you know, Shakespearean training and all that stuff. They're pals. I have yeah. no problem believing they're pals. And this is not like, well, we've set up this long story where they're pals. And so now we know it. I mean, I, Gary Lockwood, just, I mean, he sells it. He sells yeah. the Enterprise. He sells the relationship with Kirk. And you don't, uh, yeah, you don't see him dying when the show starts. Well, let's talk about a few of those other kind of trivial or not so trivial changes. Uh, this being the second pilot episode, a little bit different from what we're used to. Of course, uh, the uniforms are different. Uh, yep. There are a lot of you know little things that don't sit with you quite right if you have been watching the rest of Star Trek. Um, and one of the things, you know, Spock. Again, we haven't quite found the Spock that we know. So uh, we open with this chess game between Spock and Kirk, and uh, Spock is visibly irritated, even though he says he's not. And then, uh, boy, does he turn on that smug grin when uh, he thinks that he's got Kirk beat. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, Spock is taking on a little bit of a different role here. Um, boy, it, you know, we know that he uses logic to uh, describe what's going on, but he is the first one to reach for a phaser. He is, you know, yeah. I, I kept thinking the whole time, he is the Frank Pentangeli <laughs> yes. of the Star Trek universe. I don't know if, if for people who, you know, haven't memorized 
Godfather Part Two. <laughs> right. Uh, Frank Pentangeli. So when the uh, uh, Rizzo, R- R- Rizzotti brothers mm-hmm. are, are are starting to take over some of the Corleone family's uh, space in New York, Frank Pentangeli says we should kill him now while we got the muscle. Right. <laughs> and this is this is Spock in spades in this episode. I mean, he's just like I mean, the second he says that you know he sees that Gary Mitchell is not Gary Mitchell anymore, he's like, eh, we should kill him. Yeah, no, yeah really, he, because we're not going to be able to at some point, and then we're really going to wish we had killed him. So let's go ahead, and right, do that right. Now. So they kind of softened up Spock a little bit as things went along. And this one is kind of like, um, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm James Kirk. I'll be your captain, and by my side is Spock, aka the Enforcer. Yeah, kind of. You know, just in case anybody gets out of line. <laughs> you know, right? And to the point of actually uh, ordering weapons that that uh, Kirk didn't order when they're down on oh. Delta Vega. When they're down on <laughs> yes. Delta Vega. He's like, so Scotty has everything going up there, and Scotty's like, yeah, hey, everything's great. We've got the repairs all done. Hey, by the way, did uh, Spock get that laser? cannon i sent down <laughs> right and and, like, and i didn't order any just, laser cannon and there's spock looks like you know it's like i mean he looks like judge dread over there yeah yeah <laughs> it just rounds the corner with this massive firearm <laughs> hey, hey uh here's a couple of questions for you yeah. um talk to us a little bit about the uh the, the the scale of what's going on here we're at the edge of the galaxy and we make a point of that yeah. um i don't know if i necessarily buy the edge of the galaxy that seems like it's a really long way away well, not only does it seem like it's a long way away, <laughs> but apparently there's a like we like we've drawn a line. I'm trying to figure yeah. out is, is there like a toll booth there or a Stuckies uh, or something? I mean, hey, well, there's always a Stuckies, <laughs> yes. yes, or the last facilities, um, and then an infinity symbol. I mean, because <laughs> right. it's like they get to the edge of the galaxy, and yep. and maybe maybe this is the way the galaxy works. I don't know. And actually, you could argue this is the way the galaxy works because the second they cross out of the galaxy, they hit a thing. Right. But I mean, they're like they're at the edge of the galaxy and they don't see the thing that they're going to hit. And then they stop at the edge of the galaxy because something happened to the Valiant, you know, at the border of mm-hmm. the galaxy. And so they're like, oh, should we should we go ahead? and go? Oh, yeah. OK, let's go ahead and go. OK, punch it. Let's leave the galaxy. And yeah. it's like it's I mean, there's like a there's like a line. I mean, it's like they honked when they crossed out of the galaxy or something. <laughs> right. to like, Woo, we're out of the galaxy. <laughs> it's just it's really kind of um, it's an interesting thing. And th- there's another thing. And I, I don't want to spend time doing, you know, plot holes, summary theater. Sure. Yeah. But Delta Vega is apparently this like repair facility. It's a planet rich in minerals and crystals. It, it's a planet, you know, rich in all of these things. Uh, uninhabited but they've got like a full i mean it looks like the world's largest power station when yeah. we when we see the facility on delta vega yeah um they are able to get from the border of the galaxy to delta vega within a couple of days on impulse power but we've never left the galaxy right what's up yeah, it's not I, really. I mean, it's not really a question. I meant to. I meant to phrase that in question form. It's not a question. I just. I'm. I'm a little confused. <laughs> right. Well, in case we ever leave the galaxy and yeah. encounter trouble, let's build a repair station. But, yeah, exactly. But let's not leave the galaxy. Let's leave that yeah, for it, somebody else. And let's not leave any people there because it's <laughs> so far away. <laughs> hey, um, speaking of expendables, uh, did I hear you right, Ken? That in the uh, in the course of action, uh, Kirk basically goes up to Kelso and says, uh, by the way, I want you to hit the uh, the red button that will destroy you and everything along with it if well, I give you the signal. You know, it's actually worse for Kelso in a couple of ways. First of all, mm-hmm. he had Kelso rig up the red button. Yeah. I mean, so it's not like, okay, <laughs> right. I want you to push this button that will kill you. It is, yeah. I want you to create a system that will kill you and everybody around you with the yeah. push of a button. And then... Should things go poorly for me? Let's say I'm dead, says Kirk. Right. Let's say I'm right. dead and you're still alive. I need you yeah. to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and say if Kelso's job had been, say, you know, building the pyramids for a pharaoh, that would have been a totally okay exchange. Right. Um, but, you know, th- this is a uh, a pretty advanced uh, uh, version here of humanity. And, yeah, uh, I, yeah it just seems a little, uh, wow, eh, it's a little rough. There's, you know, no any- point, there's no point where Kelso says, well, you know what I could do? I could actually rig up a button on the Enterprise. <laughs> right. I could do this remotely, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you die, I'll get the hell out of here. Right. And then I'll push the No, no. No. Something yeah. might go wrong. No, you stay here. And uh and if I die, you come with me. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and Kelso, who seems like such a nice guy, he just doesn't have the chance to argue it. Yeah, yeah. and then part two of this whole thing sucking for Kelso is uh, 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 Mitchell picks up on the plan. Yeah. And so, you know, using his newfound powers of telekinesis, kills Kelso for no yeah. better reason than because he might have had to kill Gary. Right. And if Gary had just been nicer, nobody would have to have killed Gary. Yeah. But then but, that, that gets us into the whole philosophy exactly. bit. Exactly. Well, just a couple of other quick observations here. Um, hey, we still see a lot of that uh, sexual tension that we have in early Star Trek. Yep. Boy, Mitchell's is hitting on everybody and talking about his past. Uh, Smith, super cute yeoman. Yep. Yeah. Who immediately, uh, when there's danger on the bridge, goes up to hold Mitchell's hand. Right. What's up with yeah, that? yeah. And what's up I with know. him doing that? I know. Fly the ship, buddy. He just assumes that that's the way it's going to go. And Um, and that's exactly how it goes. I mean, maybe that's how that works for guys like that. I don't know. I just assume, yes, of course we're going to kiss. Come on. Well, like you said, we we had to kill him off because he ran the risk of out-swaggering Kirk uh, throughout the whole thing. And I found this really interesting. This episode of Star Trek, um, the second pilot, it actually premiered – to an audience at the World Science Fiction Convention before Star Trek was on TV. Um, before there was any Star Trek on TV, Gene Roddenberry took this to a sci-fi con. So it's kind of like kind of like what we do at Comic-Con now. You know, the studios come out, of course, on a much bigger scale, and they show off their new stuff. And if you're one of those select few in the audience, you get to see a little sneak peek of something that's coming up. So I thought that was really cool that, you know, back in 1966, that uh, that group of about 500 people, I think, got to see this episode. And they were just blown away by all accounts. Well, why wouldn't they be? I mean, because we can sit here 50 years later and, and make fun and say, well, isn't that – aren't the effects a little bit cheesy and isn't episodic television funny? It's mm-hmm. like we talked about before. I mean, you had what? The Outer Limits? You had um, The Twilight Zone? And yeah. you know, sometimes The Twilight Zone was about science fiction, but sometimes it was a haunted house story or sometimes right. it was just you know, some guy going mad. Yeah. If you're actually looking at – for the first time, you're looking at something that's going to treat space not as space, but you know, as yeah. like, hey, we're in space because you know, space is what we do. Let's get on to the story. And, you know, with the chance of having actually, you know, recurring characters, being able to come back to, you know, this um, ecosystem or this, this system every week. Yeah, I would have I gone nuts for it, too, you know. Yeah. Back before we had 50 years of reruns of, you know, Star Trek and a bunch of other stuff as well. It would have been mind-blowing. And I, mm-hmm. I guess I shouldn't even say it would have been. It was. Right. <laughs> and, and I think continues to be in a lot of ways. Shall we discuss the philosophy of this episode, or shall we let Gary I'm the God Mitchell do that for us? So the big thing to me in this episode is watching Gary Mitchell's transformation. You know, he's, uh, like we said, he, he's got swagger. He's this very kind of rugged man's man, and he's bragging about his conquests while all the time he's manipulating Kirk because he's finding out the boundaries of his powers. I love this exchange that he has with Kirk uh, while he's in sick bay. that he's been reading all the memory tapes and uh, he's been reading, I love he says, the long hairs, meaning mm-hmm. the great philosophers of Earth history, particularly Hume and Spinoza. And he says, but I disagree with Spinoza. Well, let's go just down a tiny little side road here and talk about Baruch Spinoza. He, he was the man who set the stage for Enlightenment philosophy. And uh, if I were to sum up Spinoza's version of God, you can best say that it's pretty much just the laws of nature. It's not a personal, powerful being. It's the sort of the laws that bind nature. He didn't really put a face on it. And um, I think Mitchell here, he, he just says, OK, I have this power. And by virtue of the fact that I have more power than anybody around me, that gives me the right to use it and exercise it at will. And Spinoza, let's go back to Spinoza a little bit here. His whole take on free will is that free will is basically an acknowledgement of human desires. You know, I realize that I'm hungry. I have the will to act on that or not. Um, so I, I'm trying to figure out exactly what Mitchell's new philosophy is here. Maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but th- there's something in Mitchell 
that makes him decide that, well, I'm, I'm not going to be the old Gary Mitchell, who's the fun-loving guy. I'm going to be the new Gary Mitchell with godlike power who can act on whatever my immediate will tells me to do. So I don't think he's totally at odds with uh, Spinoza, except in the respect that, uh, uh, well, Gary Mitchell is setting himself up as a personal, powerful, and vengeful god. Which is uh, really, I mean, it's kind of interesting, mm-hmm. especially when you think about uh, what we talked about a few weeks ago in um, in the cage. Mm-hmm. We've sort of accepted that that um, well, if we accept from the cage that religion is a thing of the past, boy, we go really quickly right back to the whole. But now I'm God, so it's yeah. now, now it's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, now, yeah. now the whole religion thing is is okay. And you're right; he, it's not even just about he doesn't just become powerful. I mean, he does set himself up as. A god, including the part in the end of the episode where he's torturing Kirk, um, you know, the whole pray to me and, right. uh, you know, makes him genuflect and uh, gets him down on his knees. I mean, just I mean, not and not makes him. It's not like General Zod saying kneel before Zod. No, it's it's he's moving his hands and, and basically treating Kirk like a marionette. Right. Putting him down on his knees, putting his hands together, making him I mean, the one thing he can't do or at least doesn't get to is the part right. where he actually makes Kirk say the words of, right. of praying to him. And Kirk is, of course, this whole time calling him out on it. You know, you're a jealous god and you've saying to Daner, you know, in so many words, this is power corrupting, (laughs) you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so I I, I don't know that there's a um, uh, a real salient point to be found there, the the message, the moral of the story. But I, I do find that transformation to be really fascinating. And, and that's what made me sit down and read a bunch of Spinoza and Hume and Descartes <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> when studying this episode. Well, you had a great weekend. I did. It was fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it, 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 I, I do feel there is a moral or a message there. And it's not necessarily, I mean, again, maybe some of the best messages are the ones where they don't just say, where you don't get the, you know, and the moral of the story is. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Daner argues a couple of times that, that what Gary is becoming may actually be a good thing, that he may mm-hmm. be the forerunner of what we're all headed towards. But at one yeah. point she argues um, that, that where he will be soon is where it would have taken man millions of years to get. And, and, and that doesn't play too well in the conference room when she brings it up. Well, I mean, the problem is he hasn't earned it. I mean, it also it, it, it's a, it's Jurassic Park again. Dr. Ian Malcolm saying the problem with the technology that you're using is uh, you haven't earned it. Do we liken that to to our new toys, um, you know, nuclear bombs in the 1960s? Relatively new toys. I mean, not not as new as they were in 1945, but certainly newer than they are today. I mean, is it, is it sort of a cautionary tale about, wow, we can do so much more than we could do just 15 years ago? Or just 20 mm-hmm. years ago, uh, maybe we should really think about how we're doing this. Let's do it the John Legend way and take it slow. What do you say? Because, <laughs> because I mean, he really does have, I mean, phenomenal cosmic power. And, and the problem with, I mean, Kirk's problem does not seem to be that he has phenomenal cosmic power. It's that he hasn't, he hasn't earned the badges. He hasn't, you know, taken the steps to gain that power. And so now with unlimited power or with absolute power, I mean, you're right during the prayer part, not really much of a prayer is something mm-hmm. like a witness, absolute power, corrupting him. Absolutely. Which is you right. know, not how I start most of my prayers, but <laughs> <laughs> assuming he Maybe was you ever, from now on, well, yeah. assuming he was ever an angry God, he may be again. If you start off with, listen, you, it was a tougher episode than some have been to pull out a moral. If there is a moral, I mean, maybe it is. It's not that, you know, there's something wrong with attaining power. It's just, I mean, being careful not only in how you attain the power, but also how you use the power. Uh, you well, know, with great power comes great responsibility. Don't just chuck it and start killing people because it's fun. Yeah. Thank you, Uncle Ben. Um, <laughs> the, the thing that uh, I think is interesting is, you know, just go back to kind of the production side for a moment. Mm-hmm. This was the second episode filmed. And the whole point was, well, we have to make a more action packed episode because the cage didn't really sell. It was too intellectual. But we have shades of the same discussion <laughs> here. You know, we really well, do. You know what's going to draw the kids in? Spinoza. <laughs> hey, if I have anything to do with it, it will. Right. Um, 
But we have shades of the same argument here that we had in the cage. We, we have this problem of power. Techn- in, in the case of the cage, you, you had the super advanced Telosians, and they had great mental powers, and they could use it to manipulate the world around them and uh, uh, manipulate the people that they drew in um, and then abuse their powers. And we kind of have, uh, you know, shades of the same thing going on here. We, we have what, what is the problem when you have too much power and not the responsibility or the wisdom to use it correctly? I mean, the one thing that's maybe a little bit better about this than the cage, I mean, the part I, you, you may remember, the part that rankled mm-hmm. me in the cage was when the Telosian said, no, 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 you guys will screw it up like we did. <laughs> right. So you can't have it. I mean, at least it's. You know, one of us yeah. <laughs> screwing it up. <laughs> we can actually yeah. we can see it happen as opposed to just you know taking somebody else's word for it. That yeah, oh, no, yeah, he's right. We would we would totally bone that. Yeah. So let's let's, yeah. let's not even go there. I mean, we do actually see Gary, who you know, again though, you do you kind of wonder like let's say, well, this is silly. That would be a silly thing to do. Oh, should we do it anyway though? What if this had happened to Spock? Well, yeah, see, there you go. Now, well, what if it had happened to this version of Spock or the Spock we know and love? Because if it happened to this version of Spock and if Spock's logic tells him that anybody is out of line, boom, phaser. Yeah, that's gone. true. That's <laughs> you true. Know? So, Spock would have not shown any of his powers and then just wiped out the crew of the Enterprise. <laughs> right. He's like, nope, you're illogical. Boom. Yeah. Gone. None of you yeah. make any sense to me. Which is, of course, what was happening with Gary as well. Right. I mean, right. that was... Um, I mean, there was an interesting thing, too, about, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's, I guess maybe you could also say that one of the messages is not to be blinded by what you want, maybe to try to be a bit more logical. I mean, the problem, yeah. though, with arguing that logic is the key in this whole thing is then really, I mean, because Spock was ready to kill Gary, I mean, like you say, immediately. The right second, away. The second he thought he wasn't Gary, he was ready to kill him. Yeah. Now, you can also say that Dr. Daner was foolish because... She has a certain amount of ESP, a small amount, but, you know, any amount's a large amount in our world, generally speaking, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we could actually mm-hmm. prove that you had just a little bit of ESP, you got a lot of ESP going at that point. Right, right. Um, whether it's because she uh, tests high on the ESP quotient or the Esper you know, quotient herself, mm-hmm. or just because she has a fascination with it, her assumption is that what's happening to Gary is a good thing or that what's happening to Gary can be a good thing. And so yeah. maybe there's a moral there, too, of like not not being blinded by what well, you want. I mean, because – and you could apply that to a certain amount of patriotism. And you can go – I mean, if you want to go to Nazi Germany with that, you can. If you want to go to mm-hmm. the House American on Activities Committee, you can. Mm-hmm. If you want to go to – you know, if you want to bring it up to post-9-11, there was some, some – I mean, there was a, there was a wonderful message of, of unity and, 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 and harmony – that happened immediately after 9-11 because I think there were a number of people who were afraid that this was going to turn very nationalistic and very ugly. Now, since then, yeah. it's kind of become maybe a little bit nationalistic and a tiny bit ugly <laughs> from time to time. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's the message. Don't, don't be blinded by what you want to be. The problem right. is if you make that a black or white argument, I mean, there's really – there's no middle road here except – well, no, there's no middle road here. I mean, either well, they should have killed Gary when they had the chance, a la Frank Pantanchelli. Yeah. Or, you know, or they get run over, which they did. And it's it's dumb luck. And I and I may stress dumb luck yeah. that Kirk was able to kill Gary. Right. Well, I mean, I, I'll give Dana the, uh, the benefit of the doubt here. You know, I think at first she's trying to express her scientific curiosity about what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, just like going back to the salt monster. Well, can is it really the right decision to just kill it because we don't understand it yet, even though it may be a threat? Is it our right to just kill it without trying to understand it at first? Right. Um, and then, but then Dana does understand what's going on at the end, and then she is the one who sacrifices herself, sacrifices her power to save Kirk and save the rest of the humans on board the Enterprise. Oh, it's so interesting that you say sacrifice. Really? Why is that, Ken? Because <laughs> because I find it interesting. Yeah. No, well, you bring up you bring up you bring up an argument that I've had with a friend of mine for years, and it's I mean it's mm-hmm. a I don't I, is there any such thing as altruism? And not to not to bring the room down, but I mean, is there mm-hmm. any such thing as altruism? You say she sacrifices herself, but could she have lived with herself had she let Gary kill everybody? It's not necessarily a mm-hmm. sacrifice. I mean, it may be a, a certain kind of uh, mental, at the very least, self preservation, knowing that she could not live with what he did. 
uh, she goes ahead and fights him, and it ends up costing her her life. And if you want to yeah. say that that sacrifice, you know, at the end of the day, that's fine because she does die. But I'm not. I mean, she's not. She's not Christ-like. I mean, she didn't. She did not lay down her life so that everyone else might live necessarily. She. I mean, she. She stopped something that she felt she had to stop. Right. Right. Does that well, make and, sense? Uh, yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, and uh, as. Well, as does Kirk ultimately with his friend. I mean, that, that's kind of what I uh, like here and what we we have seen and we will see in other Star Trek. We don't get too far ahead is that it always comes down to Kirk making the decision about who's going to live and who's going to die to set things right. You know, um, like I said, we, we don't want to we don't have foreshadow too, too much. We don't want to get into future episodes too, too much here. Um, but that that sets up. Kirk's ultimate responsibility as the captain. It just so happens that in this episode, it has a little more emotional impact because it's his friend. And this he's, hmm? this episode's also just a big nasty mess in that respect. I mean, uh, Kirk had a chance to kill Gary. I, I glossed over it a little bit in the recap when I said, you know, almost mm-hmm. kills him and then he does kill him. Well, right. I mean, he had so. There's a thing that happens where he loses his god abilities, and the way that we know he's lost his god abilities, well, no, I guess first of all, is that he's not being all god. But he right. also his <laughs> eyes go back to being normal because his eyes creepy part of the episode. By the way, it's like he's yeah. got, it's like he's got uh, you know foil balls for eyes, right, right, um, like ten foil balls. I'm sorry that sounded borderline dirty. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like he's got tin foil under his eyes or behind yeah. his eyes. It's a simple um, effect, but it's really effective. Yeah, 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 it really is. But then when his eyes go back to normal, you know that it's Gary. So, okay, um, when Daner and Gary fight, Daner weakens him to the point that he goes back to being regular Gary. Now, yeah. you would think he would be so weak at that point that Kirk would be able to just lay waste to him. But yeah. Or maybe no. I guess his eyes haven't turned yet because it's when he sees his eyes. That's right. So he's still fighting the godlike Gary, but the godlike Gary is weak because right. Daner and he have fought. So they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight, and then uh, uh, Gary ends up on the ground. Kirk's over him. Big huge rock, not as big yeah. as the one that's eventually going to do him in. But it's big huge rock yeah. over his head, about to bash his head in, and then Gary's eyes turn back to Gary just for a second. And Kirk begs for absolution from the not yeah. god Gary. Oh, forgive me, Gary. I think he says. And then of course Gary turns back into God and. At that point, Kirk really should have been toast. Yeah. But he's not. Yeah. So there's, there's one other – I know this is the – I know this is the part where we're supposed to be talking about more serious things. But there's one thing we left out earlier. Who is James mm-hmm. R. Kirk? He would have been in the wrong <laughs> grave. <laughs> well, that is a little bit of trivia that I, I, I kind of left out on purpose just because, well, I, I don't know. They all, there are all sorts of uh, fan reasons to try to retcon that into place. We we know later that it's James T. Kirk, right. um, but uh, it, this early on, they had not decided yet what James Kirk's middle name would be. They threw an R in there, and uh, See, well, not, they're all, I'm not sure that he and Gary are as good of friends as we think they are. He doesn't even know the man's middle name. <laughs> it is an age-old adage. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man, to be the sad man, behind really creepy, light up like headlights eyes. That said, there may be other lessons or morals to be learned here. So at the top of the show, we said there are some questions that we... Um, that we answer, and I think we sort of uh, tried to do them, but let's go. Let's go back uh, and hit them again. What's the moral? Is there a moral to this episode? Because it doesn't strike me as one that just that screams, you know, don't pollute the planet, or you know, right. watch out for snakes, or you know, <laughs> any of that stuff. Right. I mean, what's is there a moral to this one? And if there is, uh, what is it? No pressure. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's a uh, hit you on the head moral, but I do think it poses a pretty interesting question, which is, does power corrupt does absolute power corrupt absolutely is that inevitable and we get a we get a taste of how gary mitchell handles the power then we get a taste of how dr daner handles that power and it seems that kirk's answer to that is well it may not be the power that's the problem but it's the way in which the power was received and we have to temper power with as you said earlier responsibility as kirk says wisdom you know the um the, the process of attaining that power over time will allow you to test out what works and what doesn't and hopefully maintain a shred of humanity along with it. 
So I think it's a rumination on that question. Does that moral, if that is a moral, and I'm still not 100%, I mean, I, I, want the, I want the Aesop's fable, you know? Mm-hmm. I want the, and the moral of the story is, be happy with what you've got, or something along those lines. But mm-hmm. even in the ambiguity, I mean, I think you would have to say that that moral, that lesson, um, convoluted as it may end up sounding, I mean, definitely mm-hmm. stands the test of time. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other lesson may be to uh, always have a Vulcan with a big phaser rifle at your back. (laughs) (laughs) And don't leave the galaxy. Oh, and of course, never let your friends get too powerful. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that that may actually be it. Only hang out with people who are almost as handsome as you Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. almost as smart as you. Yeah. And almost as powerful as you. Otherwise, it, it could, it could in fact be curtains. Um, yeah. th- what about the production itself? Does the production stand the test of time? The, uh, well, you know, the effects, the acting, the whole nine. I, I'm a little bit torn on this one. Like, I, I like the idea that it doesn't look like regular Trek because we're still using a lot of the parts that were used in the cage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think just o- overall, it looks a little more dated because we're not used to seeing that crew looking the way that they do. So little things like costumes and e- even hairstyles, you know, yeah. um, some of the technology that you see, uh, which we did see in later Trek, you know, they're, they're pulling up something on the computer, but it's a typewritten page. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of funny. I love that. I'm I sorry, I'm that. picturing somebody in the 22, like the 22nd century, yeah. uh, scanning an old mimeograph of Spinoza, right into right. the enterprises, uh, into the enterprises uh, databanks. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So some of the the technology and then the effects, like the view screen and all, uh, they don't hold up as well. But I do think that the episode moves along really nicely. They kicked up the action, as was their order from NBC. Um, so that stuff holds up really well, and I think the writing is really good. Yeah. Um, there's just some great exchanges, and I think that's why I got off on that tear about Spinoza, because I, I went back to that scene. I watched that scene in sickbay several, several times, because I just wanted to pick up on every last word, every last nuance of what was going on between these characters. So I, I really dug that quite a bit. Um, I, I think if there's anything to me, and maybe it's just my kind of – uh, skeptical outlook on things. Uh, ESP uh, is a little bit dated to look at that as a serious threat. You know, uh, it, it, I think it works for science fiction on some levels, but you know, maybe I look at that and go, "Okay, really, ESP? Test it out. Prove to me that you've got ESP. And if you do, the James Randi Foundation has a million dollar prize waiting for you." <laughs> you know. Well, you're you're coming at this again fifty years later, though. I am. I yeah. am. So I mean, watching, maybe that's, watching it in context, I think it, it, it didn't bother me quite as much as uh, it yeah. didn't bother me as much as it bothered you, I think. Yeah. So those are those little things that, that I think don't hold up as a production. But but I think the writing and the action do hold up. You kind of have to get beyond the the tech, the effects, hairstyles, et cetera. And just the fact that this is the crew in an, an environment that doesn't quite look right if you've been following the rest of Star Trek. i got to add one other thing. You say the writing and the action. I also have to say the writing and the acting. I mean, the script mm-hmm. was well-written. It helped Gary Lockwood sell Gary Mitchell and sell the Enterprise. I mean, because yeah. I, really, I really do believe that he is the character that sells the Enterprise for me in this episode. Yeah. Um, and that's a combination of uh, Gary Lockwood and uh, the writers. Because, yeah. I mean, if he has nothing to say, it doesn't matter how well he says it, he can't say it that well. But if they, you know, put up a piece of wood uh, to act the part of Gary Mitchell. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think it, it, just in that respect, I mean, there's one, there's one fascinating thing where I would, I might almost argue that this is, it's interesting to me that you say the directive from NBC was to be more action because we're in sick bay for a long time. There was one point where I was watching like the conversation and, and it feels like we're in sick bay for, I don't know, it feels like we're there for quite a while, but it doesn't drag. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of conversation. It's a lot of one, it, like one place, one set, one group of people. Right. Long conversation there, but well written and, uh, and, and certainly moves the thing forward. So. Yeah, but we book into that with, you know, a good amount of action when they cross the barrier. Oh, yeah. A lot of action. That's, you know, great effect sequence. And then, of course, at the end, the big fight. 
So um, <laughs> they should go back to uh, they should go back to the edge of the galaxy at the Fourth of July because man, it was like it was like a Roman candle and sparkler factory on the bridge of the Enterprise when they left the galaxy, and uh, and of course then they can stop and get a pecan roll. Uh, yeah, at Stuckey's. All right, <laughs> exactly. One of those damn birds. Well, I will say this, you know, as much as you and I have formed the uh, mutual uh, Gary Mitchell Admiration Society, um, it, it might be a good thing here that we kind of get rid of him because that does open the door up now to evolve Spock as the friend, the confidant, and uh, to not be quite a uh, pistol-packing stick in the mud. It, it opens up the door for, uh, for, uh, for Spock and for Bones, who I, yeah. I, I can't wait until he comes back from wherever he was. Right. When they were at the edge of the galaxy. Right. Wow, right. I missed that? Yeah. Says Bones. <laughs> you guys went to the edge of the galaxy without me? No, but we got you the shirt. And, <laughs> and, and, and of course, a pecan roll. Pecan roll, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, I would say uh, yes. Stands the test of time. That's what I'll say. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm a little distracted. I'm, I'm very excited about next week. I understand next week we're having naked time. Oh, no, 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 Ken. Next week we're having the naked time. Sorry to burst your bubble. Oh, man. Well, you know what, though? It's a podcast. I'll do what I want and you can, too. All right. And, and everybody else, uh, you know, everybody else listening as well, you, you come, come as you are, as you were. As, as a you, friend, as we can. hope. Yeah. And uh, see you next time. Take care, everybody. Some of the music for the mission log provided by Warp 11, online at warp11.com, and from the album Messages, by Key Theory, free to download at kitheory.com. Unless I get my wish of becoming a real live god or demigod, we will talk again next week. And transmission. Now leaving Nerdist.com.